He's waiting for you, Chief. Yeah. How's it going? Not good. Morning, Honor. Good morning, Ed. Looks like another sizzler, huh? Yeah, it looks like it. Is that still on? So far? Ed, we'll just have to do our best. Dave, you could stop him. Not legally. What the hell with that? To hold up raid, you need a permit. This is a demonstration. That's a technicality. Yes, and I won't hide behind it. Well, if it stops them, what difference does it make? Now, look, Dave, I got nine men. If I concentrate them all here at the city limits, I could turn those hotheads back before there's any trouble. Chief, I don't look on them as hotheads. Whatever they are, there's going to be a couple of hundred of them. And let me clue you, Dave. Nine men can't patrol a line of march that long. We're going to have a riot. Insight. Stories of spiritual conflict in the 20th century. Insight. The world we live in is changing at breakneck speed. Social structures that we have taken for granted are being swept away, and new ones are being erected in their place. This is sometimes disconcerting, and on occasion painful. Change often is, even good change. In a democratic society, social progress is propelled by free discussion and the development of a consensus. On occasion, it is hurried forward by protest and peaceful demonstration. But what if the status quo refuses to change? Is violence ever justified? And can it ever work? Changing men's hearts, I mean, as well as their neighborhoods. Most of my men were born here, Dave. They're not gonna wade into their neighbors and friends with nightsticks. Not for a lot of outsiders. It's your job to keep the peace. I know my job, Dave. I've still got three hours before this thing starts. Yes. Tell him I'll be with him in a minute. Ed, for the time being, take all your calls in the council room, will you? If Kruger shows up, you try to talk some sense into him. No, I happen to think Kruger's right. I've been trying to talk some sense into you. Father, would you come in, please? Mayor Hill? Have a seat there. Oh, Millie, when Mr. Kruger comes, would you show him into the council room, please? Yes. Would that be the Mr. Kruger? Chief of the White Citizens Property Protection League? The Property Protection League, yes. How many black citizens on that Property Protection League? Why don't you and I quit playing games and get down to business? By all means, Mr. Mayor. You got the check and the sales agreement? Everything. All we need is the other party's signature. I told you I'd arrange for that. Yes, we have your honor's word for that. And I have your word that if I get the signature giving you title, that march is called off, right? Why not? A certified Negro family will be living in Lily White Greenfield. Taking possession of that house is not going to be the end of their trouble. You just get the Barnes family into that house. They'll handle all the trouble your constituents can dish out. Millie, would you call Joe Norton's office and see if he's left yet? He's here? All right, send him in. Don't even knock. Dave, we got troubles. Joe, this is Mr. Fowler. It's Joe Norton, he represents the cellar. Hi. Norton? Well, go ahead, Joe. What's up? It's off. Janet Davis won't sell. Janet? Well, what about her mother? Well, she didn't care. She's out in California permanently. But Janet called a long distance. The sudden daughterly concern for the old homestead is very touching. But why she changed her mind, assuming she ever did intend to sell? She did. Joe, why'd she change her mind? I don't know. Gentlemen, this story is more flimsy with every word. Joe, I want you to do me a favor. Go pick up Janet Davis and meet me at her mother's house in 20 minutes. All right. Don't ask her to come. Tell her. Your 11th hour timing is great. Be patient, Fowler. We're not through yet. How do I know this isn't some kind of stall? On whose part? 
Well, I don't know you, Mayor Hill. Take my word for it. I want this just as much as you do. If you wanted this as much as I do, we wouldn't be here now. That house or another one like it would have been sold to a Negro family years ago. Maybe. It may be we weren't ready for it years ago. How long have you been in office, Mayor Hale? Two years. And when did you get ready for integration? When I said start integrating or there'd be trouble? Look, if that paper isn't signed and in my hand by noon, we march. No matter who gets hurt. Two years in office, Mayor Hale. Make yourself comfortable. Morning, David. Arthur. Seems that long, hot summer's finally caught up with us. Yeah, I'm afraid it has. Having any luck with him? Fowler is in your office, isn't he? You have any objections? Heck no. No, I've just been waiting here, hoping that our little David would cut that black power Goliath down to size, because if something isn't done, no telling what might happen. You're modest, Arthur. I think you could tell us. Me? Why me? Arthur, have the good grace to be honest, if not ashamed of yourself. The way you've been whipping people up over this ought to be punishable by law. don't need whipping up, Dave. Open your eyes and you could see that. They're ready to explode. Now, you're wrong. I know these folks, Dave. People in this town like it the way it is. Not everybody. Name one. Present company accepted. One person in Greenfield who would be willing to have a ne Negro as a neighbor. I'll name you three, all on one street. So it was you who conducted that little survey last month. Arthur, I conduct surveys on any subject even remotely connected with the administration of my office. Racial attitudes fall in that class. So that you'll know where to stand in the matter when you come up for re-election? I never said I wasn't a politician. And up until now, I never thought you were a foolish one. Chief, why can't your men simply refuse to let them across the city limits? We could try. You can't violate their rights of free speech and assembly. Even the people of Greenfield can't overrule the Constitution, Arthur. David, you fight fire with fire. Fowler doesn't care anything about, about this town. Headlines, that's all he cares about. You, Arthur, do you care? I've lived here all my life. But you're still willing to fight fire with fire, no matter who gets burned or how many. Now look, I will try to protect my town and my friends from any troublemakers who come in here. Don't you talk to me about troublemakers. You don't look so pure and innocent to me just because we have the same color skin. All right, Your Honor. Let's get it out into the open. You think I don't know what you're planning? Whatever I think of you, Arthur, I'd never underrate you. But go ahead, I'll correct you if you're wrong. Seven houses here up for sale, six of them occupied. The seventh, vacant, belongs to a Mrs. Carl Wagner who moved to Los Angeles. Right on the button. You've made a deal with Fowler. You sell the house to a nigger, he calls off the march. Well, am I right? I said I'd correct you if you were wrong. Mr. Fowler, would you come in here, please? Chief, if either one of these two men try to leave before I get back, arrest them. Now, hold on. I'll take the responsibility. On what charge? Inciting to riot. How are you going to make that stick? It'll stick for an hour. And that's all I need. Chief. Gentlemen, I'll be right outside in case anyone gets fidgeted. You won't win. You want to know why? People in this town, people in this country don't like getting things rammed down their throats. Oh, it has nothing to do with some bigot trying to parlay race hatred and blind fear into some, some kind of political power base. Does that shoe fit, Mr. Kruger? Takes one to know one. Dave. I shouldn't have come. I wish I hadn't. Well, it can't hurt you to talk to him. Can't hurt him. Look, I'll tell him you're in here. How are you, Janet? Terrible. You, Mr. Mayor? Come on. Used to be Dave before I was elected. 
Hello, Dave. How's John? Well, he, he looked pretty bad at breakfast. Just about as bad as the way I look now. Not half as bad as the way I feel. Well, I wish you'd brought him along. Well, he, he, he couldn't come because he went to Milwaukee on business, but really wouldn't have made any difference because he feels exactly the way I do. Which is? Which is that we, uh, we shouldn't allow people like this to move in here. Well, if you're so sure, why do you feel so lousy? I shouldn't have come. I knew you'd try to talk me out of it. You're the one who's sure. Maybe you should be trying to talk me into it. Tell me there's a place for racial bigotry in this town. Oh, Dave, I, I have nothing against Negroes as such. It's just that I, I believe, like most people in this town, that I have a right to choose where I want to live. So? And where and with whom? Meaning your neighbors? Meaning my neighbors. Well, what about your neighbors? Don't they have a right to choose where and with whom they're going to live? Even if they're colored neighbors? Yes. Yes, damn it. Why do they have to push themselves on us? They're not going to be happy here. and Well, they're certainly not going to make us happy. This used to be a great place to give a party. You know, I wonder what the secret to that is. Some houses have it and some don't. We used to say it was the wallpaper. You just won't admit it. Admit what? That you and Jeff and your folks liked each other. You were a happy family. You could feel it when you walked in here. I guess so. Something between you had nothing to do with your neighbors. They weren't Negroes. Negro. Well, that's it. You can see there's strangers half a block away. I'm not prejudiced, Dave. I resent that remark. Look, Johnny, if you tell me something, I'll believe it. But you're making it very tough for Mr. Barnes and his family to believe you. All right, you made your point. We're not trying to make points. You make it sound like some kind of a contest. I have two men in my office right now who feel the same way you do. My side against your side, a battle to the finish, and to hell with the casualties. Well, why do we have to have a war over this? And I mean a war. You say you're not prejudiced. Well, Mr. Barnes is a decent man. I've met him. But for two good people, you've got some friends who are ready to kill each other for you. They're looking forward to the fighting and the violence because it focuses attention on them, polarizes opinion for and against. Janet, you can't be in the middle when some guy asks you with a rock in his hand. Why does it have to be this house? Because it's for sale. And they like it. And enough, they can afford it. Enough to cause all of this is this just a house. Sure. The hard part is that Negroes don't have the same choices you do when you go house hunting. So why shouldn't it be this house? Janet, what does this place mean to you? A place to grow up in? With all the little things that make growing up in one place better than being a nomad? You must have a lot of memories when you come in through this door. Christmas morning in this room. From the time Jeff came home with a broken leg and sat in front of this window in a chair all spring. Yes, and when your dad died, upstairs in bed. And all of you sat down here making sad plans for the funeral over endless cups of coffee. You threw snowballs at the wall and planted tulips in the back. And I remember you painted the basement and grew so tall you had to duck the ceiling at the bottom of the stairs. Memories are tied to times and places, Janet. And that's all they want. A place to grow in, die in, build their memories on. That's why they need this house. That's why they want this house. The same reasons your mom and dad wanted it when they bought it. still different for the people who live in the neighborhood. It's the same, absolutely the same. Because if your life has been anything like mine, it was something like this. When you move into a house, your first instinct is have nothing to do with the neighbors. Because if she's a jerk and he's a bore, you'll have them down your throat the rest of your life. Well, some are jerks and some are bores. 
One's pleasant, another makes you laugh. You get to know which is which. <laughs> My whole point is, you don't have to like your neighbor, but you can't forbid him being your neighbor or anybody else's neighbor. What about real estate values? <laughs> what about them? All right, laugh, be cynical. But they do drop, that's a economic fact. Well, it depends on the neighborhood. If people panic when a colored family moves in and there's a rush to sell off, sure, they drop. But why panic? Because they do. People do panic. People. Always people, huh, Johnny? But not you. Why did your mother change her mind? Last night, I got a telephone call. Say, can I use this phone a minute? Not for long. Call's coming in and out. Who is this? Oh, Wilson. Yeah, I'm still here. How's it going? Well, it looks from here like we're gonna have to come in. Well, that's where it's at. And Wilson, forget about that nonviolence. When they hit, we hit back. Mister, you are inciting to riot. Gentlemen, this is Davis. This is Mr. Kruger. Hello. Mr. Fowler, Police Chief Barris. Have a seat, Jenny. Excuse me. Yeah? No, no. Keep the fire department ready, but no hoses. Not yet. I brought Mrs. Davis here to tell you about a telephone call that she received last night. Go oh, and check our supply of tear gas, will you? And call me right back. Exactly what time was that, Janice? It was late, around midnight. I was asleep. Do you recognize the voice? No. Was it a man? Yes. Well, as nearly as you can remember, what did he say? Well, he, he called me by name, and then he, he said, um, uh, that lawyer Norton is going to sell your house to a, a nigger family. And I asked who it was. I, I mean, I, I, I asked who was calling. We understand. Go ahead. Yeah? Yeah. Well, that should be enough tear gas. Oh, well, check go ahead. You were asking who was calling. Mm. He said it, it didn't make any difference. And then he said something like, uh, we may not be able to get back at your mother for this, but we certainly can... It was... It was vulgar. The point was that I'd be sorry. I would be very sorry. Bodily harm. He spelled it out in no uncertain terms. The voice. Would you recognize it if you heard it again? I doubt it. I was half asleep. But you think he meant business? He sounded serious. Janet, if it weren't for that phone call, would you still object to the sale? You see, what? Every time this happens, there's trouble. You mean like that phone call last night? Like the phone call. Well, that call had to be made by a white man, one of your neighbors. Why blame the Negroes for I already it? told you why. I know you told me. I'd like you to tell them. Because if the Negroes were not trying to move in here, he wouldn't have had to make the phone call. Yeah? Keep the men in ready alert. Oh, and Try to dig up more shotguns. Any gaze. Why do you look at me like that? A couple of you rounds, asked a couple me, of I told you. Gun. Look, Shotgun I didn't start any of this. Why do you blame me? Right. Now, nobody's blaming you, Janet. Okay, let's, let's assume for the moment that you ignore the phone call and tell your mother to sell the house to the Negro family anyway. What do you think would happen? I think I'd live in fear. Fear that those people would, would carry out their threats. What are you saying? You'd rather have a helpful white terrorist for a neighbor than a peaceful black man? I'm saying that I, I just want to be left alone. Why does this have to be my decision? Why? Well, 
Thanks for a good try, Mr. Now, wait a minute, Fowler. Janet. Do you realize what hangs in the balance here? Oh, David, everybody feels the same way I do. I... Everybody? You tell me who everybody is and I'll go along with you. Integration simply doesn't work. It can and it will. Where? They rammed it down our throats in public housing projects and what was the result? Instant slums. They've tried to integrate the schools and what do they get? Whole neighborhoods up in arms. Kids riding 10 miles on a bus for the privilege and pleasure of sitting next to somebody whose skin is a different color from theirs. I'd like you to tell me how that kind of continuing turmoil makes our country a better place to live in. That's not what causes turmoil, and you know it. It's people like you resisting change. I got mine, and I'll fight to the death so they won't get theirs. But we're going to give you a chance. And while we're at it, we're going to get in a few licks for all those years we sat around doing nothing, waiting for our rights, while you were riding all over us. Not this way, Fowler. You bring those marches across the city limits, and you're asking for trouble, and you're going to get it. Mr. Mayor, we are no longer afraid. Well, give us time to work this out. People do resist change. They resist getting old, getting fat. They resist tomorrow. But they can be made to face it even willingly if we give them the chance. Like this lady here? You've already given her your best pitch. But well, what about it, Mrs. Davis? I'm sorry. It it doesn't have anything to do with you personally. It's just that I have to live in this town. I don't want my mother to sell. Okay, Chief. Call out your men. What are their orders? Protect the marchers. If you need force, use it. If anyone resists, arrest them. I'll sign the complaints myself. Will that be all? Sure. Go on out and join the fun. I'll promise you one thing, Mr. Fowler. My people won't start the trouble. But they won't run away from it either. Well, I couldn't stop him now if I wanted to. Thanks for flirting with the idea anyway, Fowler. I don't understand you, Mr. Mayor. You say that Kruger's wrong, and yet you won't come straight out and say that I'm right. I thought I made it reasonably clear I agreed with your intentions. I'm wrong, and he's wrong. And it still comes out a little like a plague on both your houses. Maybe it is, Fowler. But you see, I just don't happen to think those are the only two houses on the block. I'll see you in the infirmary. The great Pope John used to speak a great deal about the necessity of reading the signs of the times. By that he meant that the will of God could be discerned in the needs and aspirations of our fellow human beings. For us in the latter part of the 20th century, the rising consciousness of human dignity, the anguished demand of our Negro brothers for a full recognition of their dignity, for a level of education, housing, and job opportunity compatible with that dignity, is certainly one of these signs. All men of goodwill, especially those who seek to root their lives in God, will rejoice at this movement and do everything they can to further it. God created the human race as one family. That's the way he wants it. At the Last Supper he prayed that they may all be one, Father, as thou in me and I in thee, that they may all be one in us. Any cleavage in the human family based on race, any barrier created by prejudice, is contrary to God's plan. It's offensive to him. How can you call God your father unless you are ready and anxious to accept all men as your brothers? 
The civil rights movement in this country has been characterized by nonviolence. I can understand the impatience of our Negro brothers, but I hope and pray that they will always retain this approach. For violence is self-defeating. It destroys the very unity that the civil rights movement seeks to create. Martin Luther King put it so well. To our most bitter enemies, he says, we say we shall meet your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We shall meet your physical force with soul force. Throw us in jail and we shall still love you. Burn our homes and threaten our children and we shall still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities at the midnight hour and beat us and leave us half dead, and we shall still love you. But be ye assured that we shall wear you down by our capacity to suffer, and one day we shall win freedom, and not only for ourselves. We shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we shall win you as well, and our victory shall be a double victory. Insight is a production of the Paulist Fathers, a group of Catholic priests who serve their God by serving those outside their church.